So I next get to introduce a man who, in the context of the Bard, needs no introduction, um, uh, but for uh, listeners at home. Uh, I'm very, very uh, delighted to introduce Andrew Morrill, uh, who is professor and chair of academic programs here at the Bard Graduate Center in New York. He has written on the arts of early modern Northern Europe, on art and material culture of the Reformation, on early modern craft, and on the Kunstkammer, uh, as well as intersections of craft and science and theories of ornament. Uh, recent publications uh, include, uh, in a co-edited volume with uh, Mary Levin and Susanna Ivanich, uh, Religious Materiality in the Early Modern World, which is in press due out this year, 2019, uh, an article, The Power of Nature and the Agency of Art, uh, in the volume, The Agency of Things and Medieval, uh, in Medieval and Early Modern Art from 2017, Virgil's Flute, The Art and Science of Antique Letters and the Origins of Knowledge, in a volume on the primacy of the image in Northern European art, 1400 to 1700, uh, of particular relevance to our topic today, Urban Craftsmen and the Courts in 16th Century Germany, uh, in a book edited by Dagmar Eichberger and Philip Lawrence, uh, The Artist Between Court and City, 1300 to 1600, and he is currently completing a book on the culture of craft in the era of the Kunstkammer. Um, his monograph on the Augsburg painter Jörg Breu has recently been reissued in paperback and in electronic form. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Andrew Morrill today. Thank you, Mark, uh, for that generous introduction. And I'd also like to thank Mark and Vera for their, um, really for bringing this whole conception on this day into being. Um, I think I'll be dealing a little bit also with notions of um, plenitude in the Kunstkammer, but what I'd like to do with my talk is to explore a notion of techne that uh, comes from the craft world, that emerged from the urban craft culture of 16th century Germany, and which found expression in a particular category of art work, um, made specifically for the milieu of the Kunstkammer, the courtly Kunstkammer, and which I will argue modeled an important way by which rulers might develop new principles of governance. And this was the Kunststück, or the work of exemplary craftsmanship, an object that often lacked apparent function, or whose decorative and formal qualities were supererogatory to the demands of simple utility. So those useless things that Vera um, 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 invoked this morning. Set among the objects of the natural world, naturalia, and instruments of practical knowledge, scientifica, with which they were often coterminous, they were categorized in contemporary inventories as artificialia. Now, modern scholarship has tended to explain the appeal of such pieces within an art-nature paradigm as demonstrations of human and essentially technical virtuosity made in rivalry to the creations of nature. And while these qualities and this comparative framework were an important aspect of their appreciation, um, it can obscure the point that such works were, as often as not, also expressive of carefully mediated themes. Their materials, forms, and iconography embodied or addressed other areas of human knowledge and experience of human transience, of history, ethics, natural philosophy, and the broader liberal arts. So in this talk, I'd like to examine the ways such crafts, crafts works operated um, as objects of contemplation in both embodied and overtly didactic ways as material interventions into the world of the intellect and human knowledge, and as such, served in important, as important actors in their owner's pursuit of prudence the acquisition of practical wisdom. The term that is frequently used in inventory and contractual descriptions of such kinds of works is Kunststück. I, I think I have a, a sort of medley of Kunststücke, <laughs> or, it, or it's con cognates. Um, the word translates literally as piece of art or example of art, but it also contains strong connotations of demonstration or display, thus a demonstration of art demonstration piece. Thomas Rucker, whoops, um, Thomas Rucker, 
um, sword maker at the court of Dresden described a monumental iron throne that he fashioned as a Kunststück. Destined for the collection of Rudolf II, it contains in every member legs, arms, back, uh, back rails, and so forth, small chiseled scenes that describe the entire course of Roman history from Aeneas and Troy to the 16th century present, framed within an allegory of the four world empires drawn from the Book of Daniel. In 1572, um, the Augsburg instrument uh, maker Christoph Schissler, who we've already seen this morning, wrote to Elector August of Saxony, offering for sale a range of goods, among which was uh, a horologium ahas hydrographicum, a clock of ahas, which followed the biblical narrative in the Book of Kings, in which God, as assigned to King Hezekiah, caused the sun to retreat a full 10 hours backwards in time. So besides recreating this mysterious ability to make its time retreat, which he does, the sundial was also an efficient instrument that allowed the user to tell regular time to within about a minute at different latitudes during different seasons of the year and according to two different systems of conventional hours, uh, two different time systems, the conventional hours of the 60 minutes and the so-called Italian hours that divide daylight hours into 12 segments, and which therefore fluctuate with the seasons, growing longer in the summer, shorter in the winter. It's a brilliant, uh, sophisticated uh, piece um, in which the choice of Ahaz's miracle thematizes the relative nature of time that Schistler's instruments present and underlies his, the inventor's, ability to harness and control it. Schistler too described this invention as a Zonderlich Kunststück, a remarkable demonstration of art, a work of art. And so these examples serve um, as examples whose chief of works of art whose chief purpose was not so much utility per se as demonstrations of skill, of ingenuity of concept and design, an exceptional technical virtuosity for sure, but also a display of a wide range of applied theoretical knowledge. In the case of Schistler, mathematics, geometry, astronomy, and geography, brilliantly realized through the conceit of a biblical miracle. At the heart of the term Kunststück, then, is a concept of Kunst, of Techne, that is more than simply Techne understood as a practical skill. It was a conversation among all the arts, a conception of Techne wider than that of the medieval epoch, which indeed was emblematic of its passing. This conception gained ground um, steadily in Northern Europe from the beginning of the 16th century onwards. And I, the, one of the best demonstrations of this is a remarkable memorandum of 1502 written by the Venetian artist Jacopo de Barbary to uh, the elector Frederick of Wise, Duke of Saxony, asking for work, and he got it. Um, it's called um, De la Excelentia de Pittura, and uh, this is, he enumerates what the artist should be. The painter, the true painter, he claims, belongs in the company of the liberal arts. For great art is impossible without um, such knowledge being within the pr practitioner's grasp. More, he says, painting stands above all other arts as it incorporates them, into art and them all into itself. Geometry and arithmetic are necessary for measurement and proportion, which in turn are necessary to properly express the forms of nature. And he draws on Vitruvius's description of the ideal architect. He says, a necessary knowledge of music and philosophy should be there for a proper understanding of place, of the condition of the air, um, and uh, the uh, influence of air currents, the nature of trees and stones and their virtues. Equally necessary, uh, the artist should know poetry and history, uh, their subject matter, as well as their constituent parts, grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric. Um, he should know astronomy as the basis of chiromancy. And I'm going to show you uh, an image by the Ulm painter Martin Schaffner, actually a tabletop, um, which absolutely exemplifies uh, this idea of the artist. It's a kind of self-portrait. He shows himself here as Ptolemy uh, on the bottom left, right, <laughs> and surrounds himself with both virtues and liberal arts. But in doing so, shows his own ability in those arts. So, so here, geometry, for instance. He has a, quite a complicated grasp of a, a text, uh, Peter Apianus's text that he's copying here. Um, so 
Uh, in a further remarkable passage, Jacopo asserts that the painter must have knowledge of Aristotle's De Anima in order to know the forms of, how the forms of nature appear to the sight and to understand the nature of light. So such passionate advocacy for a form of art based on learning and intellectual precept famously left a deep impression upon Albrecht Dürer, uh, who befriended the Venetian and, by his own account, actively and in vain sought to learn Vitruvian principles of proportion from him. Um, but Dürer's own, of course, subsequent theoretical investigations, his deep immersion in the problems of mathematics, governing proportion and so forth, laid out in these influential um, treatises on human proportion, uh, paved the way for subsequent craftsmen to follow. And by the 1540s, the essentially Italian ideal of the incorporation of the liberal arts into practice had been fully absorbed by German elite craftsmen and humanist writers on art alike. So for instance, Johannes Neudorfer, the Nuremberg mathematician and writing master in his treatise or his notes, I should say, on artists and craftsmen from the year uh, 1547, talking about his contemporary Nuremberg artists. It was those craftsmen who displayed in their work, besides technical prowess and innovation, a thorough grounding in perspective, measure, proportion, symmetry, as well as antique subject matter and an attendant rhetoric of style. These were the things most, uh, most um, highly valued. The Kunststück evolved naturally within this craft world. And his, this newfound creativity and artistic self-consciousness was given particular momentum and direction by the collecting interests of the wealthy patrons who sought out works of technical and conceptual ingenuity that might fit within the knowledge systems of their newly conceived collections. So for the remainder of this talk, I'd like to concentrate on one particular type of Kunststück, uh, very representative, and I would stress a completely new artistic form that was wholly um, the product of the new culture of collecting. And where I hope we can observe uh, how techne uh, and, uh, and knowledge, if you like, and prudence come together. This is the Kunschrank, or art cabinet. that was purpose made to house collectibles and other small works of art, a miniature, in fact, of the wider Kunstkammer. The earliest examples were constructed as here in intarsia or wood inlay, a newly developed technique inherited from 15th century Italy of surface decoration um, made by the intricate patterning of differently figured grained and textured woods. It's a, in the process their makers created, in essence, um, an entirely new visual language that had no equivalence in the other visual media of the period. Um, and to pr practitioners and European-wide patronage, it was a novel and singular art uh, that literally constructed representation from abstract geometric shapes. And beyond the singularity of uh, technique and the ambiguity between material and representation, what made these desi designs so distinctive was their imagery, which combined naturalistic landscape settings, ruins, abstract geometric forms, often incongruously rendered as startling showpieces of perspectival um, reconstruction. Um, and these qualities are perhaps best illustrated in the so-called Rangelschrank, um, one of the most elaborate surviving examples, uh, actually the earliest surviving example, I think, dated 1566, today in Münster, and probably once owned by uh, one of the Fugger merchant family. It's one of the very first to survive, and its box-like form, as you can see, opens to reveal a two-storied double-column facade, like a Roman temple, that encloses arched doors decorated with carved scenes of famous Roman battles that are each one meticulously labelled. And behind these are the drawers and shelves in which you keep your collectibles. By contrast, the outer panels and doors are entirely covered in a rich intarsia scenes of almost surreal complexity. Tortured landscapes of ruination depicting the disintegrating remains of ancient buildings, choked with encroaching weeds and plant life and scattered with strange scrolling ornamental forms, Rollwerk or Rollkörper in German. And these lie cheek by jowl with bizarre geometric constructions. In the foreground is a series of different elements 
putty asleep against shattered fragments of classical torsos, uh, statues of obliquely rearing horses, a looming uh, vase of flowers, a turkey, something very exotic in 1566 um, in, 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 in Europe. Um, all these things interweave in a medley of forms and emblems according to a wayward poetic logic quite indifferent to scale relationships or narrative coherence. These outer panels, in contrast to the interior scenes of human history and action, turn upon a vision of the world strangely voided of human presence, implied only in broken remains scattered in a restless realm of nature. These strange images defy categorization within the normal orders of 16th century art. There are elements of still life, of landscape, um, although they, uh, uh, they're not either, uh, nor are they purely decorative art in any contemporary sense of ordered ornamentation. They con constitute an entirely original form of visual poetics, a visual formal, formal visual language uh, created um, by a peculiarly emblematic approach to objects represented, by which meaning is attached only in a loose and unspecific way to form. The individual elements of the wrangle shrank offer a suggestiveness rather than a clear articulation of meaning attaching to them. Even so, um, the cabinet's outer and inner states between the two, a broad symbolism of human transience, of course, is clear. Um, in the outer imagery of time's destruction that surrounds and envelops the interior spectacle of past Roman greatness, referenced in the battle scenes, the ordered facade. It was a fitting conceit for an object that housed uh, collectibles, ancient coins, cameos, and other curiosities, and so forth, um, by which the historical past is literally enclosed, swallowed up, as it were, by the processes of its own dissolution. It would have prompted appropriate reflections upon the pathos of time's passage and of the evanescence of earthly fame and achievement in the manner of vanitas still lives or allegories such as the sense of size by Jan Bruegel that we've already uh, seen today. Um, and which, you know, this painting is, itself uh, features a, a prominently a, a collector's cabinet on the left. In fact, the imagery of the Wrangel Schrank works in a manner very similar to that of the Bruegel. That is to say, while the theme of ru ruination dominates, a series of secondary meanings, poetic, historical, philosophical, and aesthetic are generated not by any precise matching of a signifier to a specific signified, but by an elusiveness of juxtaposition, of jostling fragments drawn from different cultural registers in the Kunstkammer things, as well as the, the intarsia, um, of variety and density, of amplificatio, of a piling up of ornament as a means of intensification. These are rhetorical methods applied here in the Rangelschank in visual and ornamental terms that uh, Walter Benjamin found employed in the structures of Baroque literary tragedy, the Trauerspiel, methods which work in both literary and visual genres to similar effects of pathos, melancholy, and a sense of loss attached to the historical. So I want to make clear the huge inventiveness of what is going on here and make two broad points. The first is to note how the imagery, the form, and the operation of the cabinet that encloses and discloses colors and conditions the viewer's response to the contents. I stress this to make clear the manner by which knowledge of things in the Kunstkammer comes to be known. It's not laid out in a clear, logical, taxonomic categories of the 18th centuries, and you know the, the character of 18th century cabinets are much, much clearer, or indeed the transparent glass museum displays of today. Um, instead, the knowledge must be revealed. It is performative. The nature and form of the cabinet itself is important in this process. It becomes an active and determinative um, instrument in the process of acquiring and digesting knowledge of its context. That is, Knowledge of the contents is determined by the intelligence, the logic of the construction of the cabinet itself. Cabinet and contents had literally to be performed to be known. 
It's a very pre-18th century notion of, of acquiring knowledge. Above all, it reveals the distinctive attitude to the pleasures, one might say, of scientific uncertainty that was housed and revealed in, the, in the, this puzzle of a cabinet. And um, where techne of the cabinet making and knowledge um, of what is inside and any ensuing wisdom become very closely intermingled. The second point I'd like to make is that the Rangelschein's imagery suggests some of the habits of thinking that were provoked by these methods of display in both the imagery of the Rangelschein, but I think in the Kunstkammer more broadly. Um, for the cumulative effects of the Kunststücke of this kind, and I'll go back to my little medley um, here, made in many different media, including metalwork, hard stones, clockwork, automata, sculptures, vases, jewelry, and so on, jostling for attention amid a welter of like objects, and which trafficked so promiscuously in materials, form language, imagery, and themes, was that it encouraged the owner to be both to be by turn naturalist, theologian, cosmologist, ethicist, historian, antiquarian, and so on. These objects addressed large questions some ontological, the nature of existence, some ethical, um, how best to live in the world. Their themes could encompass the universe, sometimes specific <coughs> histories. Like the Kunstschrank imagery, the Kunstkammer space and its objects together communicated through metaphor and correspondences. They crossed disparate fields, frames of reference, states of being between cosmos and mind, nature and history, in some works, knowledge was transmitted in narrative form, as in Rooker's throne. In others, it's, it's, it's related rhetorically or emblematically. Their meanings often moved between the factual and the mythological and the allegorical, sometimes in the same piece. Um, these, the registers of meaning are sometimes clear, at other times they're vague generating an effect akin to a, a thought dimly emerging to consciousness. The point is such variety of theme and means of transmission encouraged, I think, this exhilarating heterodoxy of thinking required viewers to draw upon and cross-reference their own reservoirs of learning across these different fields. Um, okay. Um, I want now to turn to a second type of cabinet that emerged in the 1570s, slowly taking over the taste for intarsia, where the imagery is very much more overtly explicit and didactic. Um, decorated with dark ebony, veneers and silver mounts, constructed so as to uh, resemble miniature antique temples, their facades inset with niche sculptures of virtues and other allegories. Um, they emerged in Nuremberg and are quickly taken up in other cabinet centers, uh, notably um, Augsburg. And its form encouraged and was indeed perhaps conditioned by its ability to carry a complex iconographical message. Um, and these programs were often linked to the function of these cabinets as rep repositories of knowledge, uh, quite explicitly to their acquisition of prudential wisdom by using the language, the ornamental language of aspirational rhetoric. Um, I'll, sh I'll give you an example. This is a, uh, a cabinet that's found in Corsham Course, uh, a house in England today. It's by the Augsburg cabinet maker Hans Jakob um, Bachmann, around 1640. Um, when opened, its interior reveals three main silver reliefs set across the central cabinet and flanking doors. In the center, we have a high priest, it's actually Aaron, um, standing before a temple curtain, um, and it's labeled Ecclesia. To the right, you have a military commander, and it's labeled Militia, and to the left, there's a laborer digging, a woman spinning in the manner of Adam and Eve, labeled Economia. That's to say they symbolize the three realms of activity over which just the individual, but also the ruler, um, should govern the spiritual, the economic, and the military. The framework was broadly Aristotelian. The three categories conform more or less to the way Arist 
Aristotelian moral philosophy was traditionally taught in the university curriculum. That is through the highly, uh, the three influential texts, the, Nicoma the Nicomachean ethics, the politics, and the pseudo-Aristotelian economia. They were used as the basic text for teaching and creating a division that was broadly followed in subsequent moral treatises and textbooks by humanists and philosophers up to and beyond the 16th century. These categories are surrounded by uh, the theological and cardinal virtues on this cabinet, the platonic Christian moral qualities by which one should conduct oneself. Now, a surviving description of a similar cabinet um, in a letter of December the 5th, 1587, from the Augsburg merchant Hans Fugger to Archduke Ferdinand of Tyrol, in which he's trying to persuade the Archduke to uh, buy one of his cabinets, shows us the manner in which these programs were intended to be read. The surface ornament is described thus, and I think I have the text. The outer and inner parts are decorated beautifully with great skill, with silver and gilded pictures and histories in which a summer is shown. How and what manner princes and lords and all those who Almighty God in his divine wisdom has placed on the highest seats of worldly government shall account piously and worthily both to God and to their subjects here below on earth, or which spiritual and worldly virtues should ornament a regent. And such things are demonstrated not only through the representation of the most beautiful and worthy portraits and virtues themselves, they're brought uh, before the eyes through biblical and pagan histories um, and exemplar that such things may be experienced in a much more pleasant and splendid way than I can here describe. There then follows a long description of the iconographic program, which establishes the position of the ruler within the divine order, uh, with plaquettes of biblical and Roman history, the seasons, uh, the line of ancient kings um, and emperors, and like the caution cabinets on the screen, the central door of the inner register was mounted with a triad of figures. Um, in this case, the Judgment of Solomon uh, and two statues of David and Isaiah um, surrounding, and they too were surrounded by the cardinal and theological virtues. And finally, on the upper register of the outer part, um, there are figures of labor, overcoming sloth, fame and eternal glory, in order to show, as Fugger said, that in all affairs, effort, labor, and industry must be expended to ensure eternal praise, honor, and fame. And then crowning the piece was a recumbent figure of geometry holding up a globe. Though not specified as such in the description, these three Old Testament figures who dominate, Solomon, David, and Isaiah, symbolize three areas of knowledge necessary to a prince. The wisdom and sagacity of a venerable philosopher, um, Solomon, the active wisdom of good kingship in David, and the spiritual illumination of a prophet, priest, Isaiah. One can compare it with another roughly conterminous triad of virtues found in a flattering description of King James I of England, contained in James Clayland's The Institution of a Young Nobleman, in which the author confers the same set of ideal qualities upon his monarch. Quote, he standeth invested with that triplicity in which great veneration was ascribed to the ancient Hermes, the power and fortune of a king, the knowledge and illumination of a priest, the learning and universality of a philosopher. So the goal of the prince in such literary encomia and or instructions to princes was just rule, which was to be won by the virtuous exercise of power as bodied forth in the scenes of Roman history and so on in the casket. This in turn could only be attained by a strenuous seeking after knowledge, symbolized by the liberal arts that are also there in combination with the active virtue of labor. Fugger's description further makes clear the aims and the appropriate limits of learning. To be studious and contemplative, but also to be able to translate knowledge into power in the active life was the object of the prince's discipline. The aim of study was not knowledge for its own sake, but the attainment of prudence, of practical wisdom, which would translate into good rule. As expressed by Fulk Greville, another English source of much the same time in a treatise of human learning, quote, the chief use then in man of what he knows is his pains taken for the good of all, the common good. 
Yet some seek knowledge merely but to know, an idle curiosity that is. So here we have in the uh, literary encomia, as it were, and instructions, a sort of advocacy of contingent wisdom rather than contemplative wisdom in its own right. A final example, I hope, and I hope I've got time. Um, do I have time? Okay. Um, can demonstrate, I think, uh, a direct link between the Kunschrank and Kicherberg's ideas. Um, it's the Kunschrank created by Philipp Heinhofer, uh, the Augsburg merchant, dealer, diplomat, and art collector for Duke Philip II of Pomerania um, for his Kunstkammer in Stettin Castle. Heinhofer was the key figure in the development of the Kunstschrank in the 17th century, and through his own extensive trading and collecting activities, his wide familiarity and close contacts with cultural circles and European courts, he became an art advisor and agent in acquiring objects and works of art. And it was he who single-mindedly uh, developed the Kunstschrank into a really a truly monumental work of art. Anticipating the Marshal Messier of the 18th century Paris, he commissioned many different craftsmen to work on a singular ca single cabinet and its contents. It was often several years in the making and filled their drawers with suitable Kunstkammer objects he would assemble himself before arra arranging their sale. The Pomeranian uh, cabinet took seven years to make, and here's the famous uh, painting of its presentation uh, to the court at Stettin. Uh, there is, uh, on the left, upper left, is the Duke with his wife and uh, Philip Heinhofer himself demonstrating, uh, uh, you can see uh, one of the shelves there. Um, and below and to the right, you have all the, uh, the uh, craftsmen who were actually involved. Now, the cabinet itself was destroyed in World War II in Berlin. Uh, it's still ex the contents, however, still exist. Um, and so the, the painting, is, uh, which was an integral part of the cabinet, uh, it was hidden in a secret drawer um, and still survives, thankfully, um, is a, an important piece of evidence. Um, it's noteworthy that unlike any of the Kunschanke that Heinhofer subsequently make, that the contents here are completely made of artificialia, of craft tools and implements. There are no naturalia or real exotica. The main body contained writing implements, surgical and barber tools, mathematical instruments, gun sights, eating and drinking vessels, mechanical dolls, board games, and entertainments, um, while the base, uh, contained an array of tools and instruments made of noble metals. Hammers, a wire drawing uh, instrument, saws, and so on. There's also a self-playing organ um, in the base there. Now, what is striking is how closely this emphasis on craft and technology follows the suggestions laid out in section four of Kicherberg's inscriptions, which he devotes to craft people's tools and machines of all kinds. Instruments for writing, surveying, hunting, gardening, making war, making music, raising weights, wire drawing, undertaking surgery and dissection, barbers and toiletry implements, all the tools, as Kicherberg says, by which artisans all over the world in our time nourish the world. Now, the outer decoration uh, in this tradition of the ebony and silver mingled the Duke's personal insignia with personifications of the liberal arts, culminating in music at the top, uh, represented by the, the nine muses. And right on the top, um, you have uh, the uh, ninth muse, uh, Calliope, muse of epic poetry, conversing with Minerva, goddess of wisdom, by the fountain of the Hippocrene, the sacred spring on Mount Helicon. The symbolic union of art, Techne and pra prudence, practical wisdom, one might say, gives rise to fame symbolized by Pegasus, whose hoof creates the sacred spring as he leaps into space, carrying the Duke's renown to the stars. This rhetorical exhortation to the Duke to achieve the pinnacle of virtue and eternal fame thus forms the outer preamble to a consideration of the implements and instruments within by which he will achieve it. There's good reason to think that this cabinet was influenced directly by Kicherberg's ideas and that Heinhofer was even influenced by Kicherberg's example. During an extended stay in 1611 at the 
court of Munich, Heinhofer, at the recommendation of the Duke, um, closely examined a set of richly illustrated musical um, manuscripts commissioned by the Duke's father, Albrecht, and considered exceptional treasures of the ducal collection. Heinhofer's travel diary describes in some detail the volume of Orlando di Lasso's Sani Penitentiales of King David, made between 1559 and 71. Um, this exquisite edition of the Psalms was a kind of Gesamt Kunstwerk, the music composed by the famous Orlando di Lasso. Whoops, um, I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, the illum illuminations executed by the court painter, Hans Mielich, the script, bookbinding, gilding, each by separate and named masters, each of whom is represented by a portrait. And the overall conceptor, the inspiration, the spiritus rectus, rector behind the project was Samuel Kicherberg, whose portrait you see on the left-hand side. Um, he also contributed two further volumes of commentary to accompany uh, the the, the, the volumes. Um, Heinhofer also singled out in his travel diaries this image here at the end of the volume on the Psalms, which he, so, he says, quote, shows on one sheet the foremost musicians who lived between 1560 and 1570, each with his instrument on which he excels. The image of court musicians, and I've got a little detail there, there's Orlando de Lasso here on the left, uh, very much in control. Um, the important thing is that this is not a portrait of a particular event or an actual concert, but as Heinhofer says, it's an imagined collocation of musicians who had worked at the Hof Capella over a 10 year period. And, and, and the scratch below lists all their names. This commemorative image um, seems to have been the inspiration for. Heinhofer's own painting of the presentation of the Pomeranian Kunschrank at court. Um, for this too, it's important to realize it's not a portrait of a real event. It's not a representative, only two people, Heinhofer and the actual cabinet maker, Ulrich Baumgarten, Baumgartner, actually accompanied the cabinet to Stettin in 1617. Instead, like Orlando de Lasso and his elite musicians, the painting is a record of the elite craft collective that worked over seven years under Heinhofer's leadership. Seen in this light, we may see the Kunstschrank situated at the center of the room of the Kunstkammer that was devoted to Artificialia in the Duke's collection as a statement of a larger purpose of the role of craft and technology within the workings of the court. Heinhofer seems to be staking a claim for craft and technology to be considered as an arm of the court, a state department, one might say, akin to the court chapel and the other advisory bodies represented in the illuminated manuscript um, I mentioned, and to see himself as the head, the conceptor, responsible for marshalling his craftsmen, akin to Kicherberg. Indeed, there's strong evidence that at least from 1615, Heinhofer had sought a position as counselor extraordinary, extraordinary uh, to Duke Philip's um, innermost circle of advisors at the Pomeranian court. Um, and this honor seems indeed to have been conferred upon him in 1617, coinciding with the delivery of the cabinet. So as an addendum, so here, here we have a clear it's a statement of techno and governance. And as a way, and there's just a picture, as a way as of finishing, um, one can note that the Werkzeug Kabinett, the cabinet of instruments, had plenty of earlier precedents. Then Solyamnitsa produced a silver cabinet of his own designs, instruments of his own design for the Duke of Saxony, um, for which versions of the manuscript operation, uh, operation manual have survived. And Kicherberg himself mentions in his inscriptions the, Aug the Augsburg merchant Anton Meuting's orders for such exactly such cabinet schenker of tools and instruments um, that were in great demand in Spain. Perhaps the most telling example of this type of cabinet as regards its purpose is the, uh, in the propagation of technological expertise to its owner as a gift by the Bavarian court uh, the Duke, um, Maximilian I, 
on September the 1st, 1617, of a Kunstschrank containing rare artificialia and scientifica to the Ming Emperor Wan Li. It was filled with both tools and products of local German artisanal expertise, including scientific instruments, clocks, and automata, silver life casts, as well as an extensive group of turned ivory works. This gift formed part of a Jesuit mission to the Chinese court that Maximilian sponsored, and was part of a Jesuit strategy of propagatio fidei persientias, propagation of faith through science, of capturing the hearts and minds of the Chinese emperor and his court by instruction in Western technologies. And an acknowledgement, and I'm showing you here that it no longer exists, but here is the letter written by Maximilian and an inventory account of its contents that still survive. Um, yeah, so I want to acknowledge here the work of my student, who's here, Joyce Tsao, uh, whose BGC qualifying paper seeks to explain the presence in the Chinese imperial collections of two 17th century German turned ivory works comparable to this, comparable to works, say, by Lorenz Zink. Um, the presence in uh, Maximilian's gifted cabinet of such ivories is very, very um, suggestive to her argument. An ivory turning brings into sharp focus, as a final point, the meanings of the Kunststück um, their no and, and for their noble owners. The craft required a great deal of technical skill, patience, sound judgment, in addition to knowledge of mathematics, geometry, and perspective. It was therefore regarded as an ideal employment for princes. For as Klaus Maurice has suggested, the inculcation of these skills in turn translated smoothly into the realm of governance. Friedrich Kleinert, author of a 1683 treatise on lathe turning, or hymn to turning, makes this explicit. He says, the prince who turns promotes trade and encourages change thanks to his understanding of matters technical and thus increases the prosperity of his country. And I'm showing you here the frontispiece of another uh, treatise on turning of 1683 by Joachim uh, Müllner, where again you can see Minerva at her ivory lathe um, and uh, the ivory products around that have been turned, which have encouraged abundance, <laughs> Um, uh, overseen by Mercury, the god of commerce. Um, so again, explicit link between techne and uh, efficient and prosperous governance. So Kleinert's words take us to the core of the Kunststück's symbolic significance, that whether an ivory sculpture, a historiated iron throne, a sundial that could stop the sun in its tracks, or the intricate puzzle of a Kunstschrank, all ultimately offered up for contemplation and appreciation a set of technical and ratiocinative skills that suggested new means by which to describe experience, um, how to evaluate it, and at its best, how to imagine its transformation. For those noble patrons and members of their circle who engaged in their evaluation, these supreme works of craft were exemplars of creativity and innovation and modeled the liberating way in which the world itself might be remade. In an important way, therefore, the Kunststück, the craftwork, stood as an emblem of the larger creativity that characterized the culture of the later Renaissance and the centrality of the craft economy within it. Thanks very much. So, uh, we are running a little late, so uh, we want to take some time for questions. Um, uh, Vera? So fantastic. And I just wanted to return to the 1566 uh, example and thinking about um, the original state of it being incredibly colorful, no doubt, especially green yeah. uh, on the outer part, which in some ways undercuts that division between fame of the ancient Romans and uh, the memento mori aspects of the front because the front would be so vivid and alive versus the lack of color on the interior. So I wonder if that's some way, not only to think about it um, polysemiotically, but also to think about the potential for copia and for growth within this kind of flux, within this world of change. It's not only about death, it's also about death and 
<coughs> death and procreation. That's a very interesting observation. Um, I must admit, I see the, the essential imagery of, of the outer shell as the forces of nature. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's rare, but here we have the forces of nature as basically a destructive mm -hmm. force against the forces of culture. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and, and so even yeah. the fecundity of nature mm. is something that is essentially, <coughs> inevitably, ineluctably mm. part of time's march. Yeah. So nature is being used as a kind of symbol of time mm -hmm. in, in a very sort of interesting and kind of unusual way. Mm -hmm. This is how I, I see it. But, uh, yeah, you, well, you, you, yeah, one thing that made me think about it was Pancharoli's uh, title page, which of course is much later, but it contrasts falling down broken Roman sculptures with the new world. And so the, the turkey in particular made me think about that. So it's balancing loss and yeah. discovery. Yeah. Um, let me think. <laughs> yeah. These are policy mechanisms. Yeah. Andrew, if I could ask something quickly, um, which is about the, the sort of utility of the Kunststück. Um, uh, and this is. Uh, Years and years ago, uh, I put together an exhibition sort of constructing a Kunstkammer out of the objects one could find in the contemporary university. And one of the things that we encountered were objects that came out of the physics and engineering machine shops, um, where when they got a new lathe or a new laser cutter or whatever it is, they created objects. We had a spring that bounced in only one direction. We had a... Uh, round peg that fit in a square hole, um, very, very intricate but functionless gears, um, and so forth. And the idea was they got the machines and they would challenge themselves to produce as intricate and elaborate and precise objects, but functionless ones, so that they could figure out what the limits of the machines were before putting them to use. And I, I don't know whether it's even possible to speculate, but if one imagines the craftsman or for that of the princes, turning ivory as elaborately as this, or producing marquetry as elaborate as this, whether this isn't also, in a sense, refining the technique and the technology to the point that it can be put to economic use. <laughs> <laughs> Again, we're in the slightly of speculation, and it's, obviously it's very difficult to say, but yes, it's a very suggestive idea. And I think the, the prince, what we know about princes turning the products, actually, some of the 18th century were quite big, but in the 16th century, 17th, 17th century, what we know, they're fairly basic and clearly require the IP turning to the system. <coughs> but, but, but yes, um, the knowledge of techno practice um, clearly, well, clearly would be, um, would be a, a stimulus for sure um, for knowing where to go and where technology could, 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 could progress. One likes to think. One, like one would like to think, yes. I was, um, I was wondering if you've had a chance to think yet about the ways in which so many of the Kunststücke play with one's own sense of perception, right? So I'm thinking about the, mar the marquetry geometrical figures that you showed. I'm thinking of like the paintings on stone and so on and so forth, right? Where you look at the thing and you're not quite sure what it is and it's kind of constantly changing. And I'm wondering if you, uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying like, have you thought about this question of perception with regards to knowledge inside the Kunstkammer? Yeah, I mean, part of um, what I was trying to suggest earlier, you know, in the early part of the talk was precisely these different registers right. um, of transmission of knowledge. It's really mm. the, the way knowledge is through allegory, through narrative, mm. through, you know, in all these different ways um, that, in a sense, create a puzzle all its own. That the, mm -hmm. that the, or you have to bring these different kinds of knowledge mm -hmm. to bear in order to understand. And of course, having these things jostling with each other, jostling, juxtaposed with each other, um, again, can suggest ways of cross-referencing that might lead to 
Or you could, or it could undermine your knowledge, right? If you're looking at something and you think it's X, and then you switch positions, or you see it differently, and then it's Y, right? So it kind of undermines. I, yeah, I, I see <coughs> lots of different ways to understand it, which mm -hmm. were accepted ways, mm -hmm. you know, um, of the time. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's the love of difficulty, which is yeah. kind of the uh, top of the time, mm -hmm. unraveling, mm -hmm. and it's part of the enjoyment of you know. Mm -hmm. And, and you know the complexity of a of one of these cabinets, you know, with forty drawers, sixteen of them hit, hidden drawers, you know, helps in this in this puzzle of extricating knowledge um, through knowledge of the cabinet itself. Um, when the the, uh, the cabinet handle, this cabinet was given by the Oxford Council to the Gustavus Adolphus, uh, went to Sweden. Um, unfortunately. Started off as a dog, we went to Sweden. The, the uh, cabinet maker went with it, with it in order to explain this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this notion of performativity of knowledge, um, something that's largely lost, I think, to the first today, is a particular form of enjoyment and satisfaction. Um. Yes, and then one question in the back, and since we're almost 20 minutes late, uh, I'll make that the last two questions. So, um, Tom? I, I think your last remark presents, uh, you know, a large, interesting interpretive difficulty, which is tenet, which you brought up, and uh, that is between what you were describing as the polysemic uh, character of the objects and of the Kunstheimer in general, and of, you know, the what is performative, and uh, namely what is being performed is an effort to establish uh, the, the, the intention behind the piece and the, a, a specific kind of meaning, perhaps. And that becomes evident in what you're suggesting in the letters that are presented. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that uh, as another interpretive thing we have to think about, uh, just I'd like to observe in regard to, you know, Walter Benjamin's much ballyhooed writing, when you actually read these texts, as you probably have done, I mean, Lowenstein and the rest of them. And, uh, you know, they are copious and encyclopedic in their own way with lots of uh, writing around them. And it's clear that there's an intention behind the author that he wants to have a reading that is established, which is often related to a prince. And I can think of it just to bring these things together. Uh, if one thinks about, um, you know, Lowenstein's role in uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, 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 the legacy of the princely chapel, where, which is executed... Uh, by Rauschmiller, who is also a person who does ivory works in the 17th century. And, of course, you know, it's art. You can read these things in various ways, and we have ways of reading them. You know, one of the wonders and one of the pleasures of this is involved in, 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 in what is exceeding meaning and the possibility of imposing all kinds of things and changing them around and moving them. But, you know, uh, within the princely context and within established meaning, and that's also related to the, uh, you know, to Jessica's talk, there is perhaps some kind of established meaning that is to be accepted, so that there is perhaps a tension between these things. And I hope you know that we can think about these things too. Now, what I'm wondering about is if you see a if you see a progression from you know what you're suggesting uh, from the earlier to the later, and perhaps you know I don't, I don't know if, if you're. Because you were suggesting that there is a... There's an implicit progression, yeah, yes. But yeah. I, I should say that, yeah. you know, in 15, 1672, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Daniel de Barbara is extolling the virtues of yeah. intarsia and comparing it to yeah. the end of the form. So yeah. it, the two are going side by side, yeah. I think. It's difficult. I wouldn't see it necessarily in terms of progression. Too. Yeah. So, yeah, and... Uh, yeah, so it's possible that you have these, I mean, yes, already already in the Kunschank earlier, and clearly in the... Yeah. Yeah, nice. Thank you. I really agree with you. Very good. And our last question. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm wondering about the performativity of governance implicit in the lathe itself as a mechanism, because it needs precise calibration, otherwise the entire piece is warped. That's right. So, so you know, um, the, the fixing of the lathe, the ordering of the yeah. lathe, you know, requires this knowledge, this pre-knowledge But it's also representative as well of the mechanics that go go into government. It's all, all of the components, all of the people, all of the departments, if you will. I mean, it's symbolic, I think, of the overall, in a way, political mechanism. I'm trying to think of 
that particular metaphor is used in the treatises and, and uh, the, 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 the graph. Certainly, you know, the practice of uh, returning with its complexity, mm. it's, you know, it, it's the, the prior knowledge that is necessary, um, is used as a kind of metaphor for good rule. Beyond that, I can't, I can't Sure, but if the foundation's not in place, if it's not properly sure. calibrated, yeah. it just all you, falls if apart. If crack the, yeah. the, the ivory, yeah. the state collapses, yeah. It <laughs> <laughs> doesn't come back together. So, um, what do you think? Uh, we should make an abbreviated call. Yes, I'm so sorry. Uh, what would you say? Oh, and sorry. Yeah.